The periodic table, with its neatly arranged rows and columns, is one of mankind's greatest achievements. It organizes the elements by their physical and chemical properties, and it's a logical way of understanding them. But for much of human history, it was like piecing together a jigsaw puzzle, as many of the elements were unknown at the time. Today, we'll learn about the history of the periodic table, and how they're arranged in specific groups and families. Let's figure out the periodic table piece by piece. Many civilizations knew about the metals of antiquity. These may have included silver and gold, which were found in their pure forms. Others were extracted from ores using fire and heat, and this led to the copper, the bronze, and the iron age. In 1790, there were only 23 known elements, and these included the metals of antiquity, things like carbon and oxygen. But by 1870, with the invention of electricity, we were able to break compounds down into their individual elements, and along with the Industrial Revolution, where we're making new products like soaps and dyes, we're creating new compounds and we're discovering new elements. The list had grown to 70 elements. English chemist John Newlands was one of the first to notice that if you arrange the elements by order of increasing mass, every eight elements would have the same properties. He called this the law of octaves because it was similar to how notes on the musical scale repeat every octave. There were some discrepancies in how he arranged the elements, and ultimately his idea was dismissed as being unscientific because he used a musical analogy. Dmitri Mendeleev is known as the father of the periodic table. Not only did he arrange the elements by order of increasing atomic mass, he placed elements with similar physical and chemical properties into the same vertical columns known as groups and families. What set Mendeleev apart from other scientists was he was able to make predictions about unknown elements at the time. He left blanks and question marks on the periodic table, and he predicted the existence of gallium years before it was discovered. He said that gallium would have an extremely low melting point. It turns out it's around body temperature. He predicted the density of gallium, as well as its atomic mass, which was around 68. Well, it turns out the true atomic mass of gallium is about 69. Mendeleev arranged his elements by order of increasing atomic mass, but this led to a few discrepancies where elements weren't in the right families and they weren't in the right groups. However, by the 20th century, modern scientists had figured out that if you arrange the elements by order of increasing atomic number, this would solve many of those discrepancies and problems. And thus, we figured out the puzzle of the periodic table. So just keep in mind that every periodic table is just slightly different some have different colors on them, but they're all trying to convey the same information, and that is, if you're in the same vertical column, that means you're in the same group or family, and groups and families exhibit and display the same physical and chemical properties. So this first group on the far left is known as the alkali metal group, so that would include lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. The second group is known as the alkaline earth metals, and these guys are also quite reactive in water okay if you place them in water they sort of ignite and this whole middle rectangle okay you might be familiar with this from the electron configuration video but this is they're known as the d block or transition metals in the center there okay and so that whole entire rectangle has somewhat similar properties and depending on the periodic table you might see like an actual like staircase going across but this separates the metals from the non-metals. And if you're either on or below the periodic table, that makes you a metalloid. Okay, so the metalloids are like boron, silicon, germanium. They kind of display properties of both metals and non-metals. Okay, and again, to the right of the staircase, you start finding your non-metal families. So things like the oxygen family and the halogen family. And this column here, you might know, as the noble gases. So they're noble because they don't react with other elements. And they have properties like if you excite them with electricity, they glow. Let's study some group trends now. Just keep in mind, I removed D block and I removed F block. So that leaves us with just S and P. And these are the representative elements because they show the widest range of properties. So now we're going to fill in these trends starting with valence electrons. So the alkali family has one valence electron, and then we're just gonna go from left to right. 
So the alkaline earth metals have two valence electrons, boron family three, carbon four, nitrogen five, oxygen six, halogens have seven, and noble gases have eight valence electrons. And I'm going to circle the number eight because it's a magic number. If you have eight valence electrons, you're stable like a noble gas. Noble gases tend not to react with other elements. Okay, so I'm going to write the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in the center there. Okay, and we're going to figure out what the ionic charges are. So if you are sitting at one valence electron, what's easier for you to do? To gain seven electrons or to lose one? You have two options, and it turns out losing one electron is easier. So when you lose an electron, you become positive overall, plus one. If you have two valence electrons, it's easier to lose two electrons. So now you become a plus two. If you are boron family, you're going to form a plus three charge. But what if now you're sitting in the center at four? Because you have the option to gain four or to lose four. And because that's the case, it's going to be plus or minus four. If you're at five, so these families to the right of the staircase tend to gain electrons. So nitrogen will want to gain three and not lose five electrons because it doesn't make sense. It's harder for it to do. So when you gain three, you become a negative three. And if you have six valence electrons, you need to gain two more, forming a negative two charge. And if you're sitting at seven, the halogens tend to gain one more electron. They're really electron hungry, which we'll discuss later. And noble gases have a charge of zero. They're stable. So there's no point in gaining or losing electrons. The next thing that we'll look at is the electron configuration. So alkali families have one valence electron so they're s1 the alkaline earth metals have two valence electrons so they're s2 and moving over to boron family boron has s2 p1 okay let's add these numbers up two plus one makes three so that's how we get three valence electrons Carbon family, S2, P2. These are like their ending coordinates. Okay, so go back and watch the electron configuration video if you've forgotten. Nitrogen family is S2, P3 for a total of five electrons, five valence electrons. Oxygen, S2, P4. Halogens all end on S2, P5. And finally, your noble gases are all S2, P6. And at the bottom, I'll just fill this in again. Okay, it's good just to get familiar with these names. These are the alkali metals. Column two is the alkaline earth metals. Then you have boron family. There's no special names for some of these. Carbon family, nitrogen family all the way down, oxygen family, this one has a fancy name. These are called the halogens, and these are the noble gases. Before I take off, I'll provide you with a summary of the periodic table. Elements are arranged by order of increasing atomic number. They're also placed into vertical columns known as groups and families. Elements within the same group or family display similar physical and chemical properties because they have the same number of valence electrons. Furthermore, if you're to the left of the staircase, you're generally a metal, and metals give up electrons. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity, they're malleable, they all have the same physical properties. If you're on the staircase, you're a metalloid, and metalloids display characteristics of both metals and nonmetals. They're kind of like the halfway in between guys, where they have traits of both worlds. So just take silicon, for example. Silicon is a good semiconductor. It's not extremely good at conducting heat, but it's not so bad at it either, so it makes them ideal in computers. If you're to the right of the staircase, this makes you a non-metal, and non-metals are as the name suggests. They don't have characteristics of metals. They tend to be brittle. They tend to be gases at room temperature. Gases like the halogens, like chlorine or oxygen, for example. 
and non-metals tend to gain electrons. They want electrons, and you're going to see later on, chlorine is really desperate for just one more electron. They have seven valence electrons, the halogens do, so they tend to gain one more electron. So again, just keep in mind for later on, metals tend to give up electrons, non-metals want electrons. And last but not least, the looping image above me, these are alkali metals, and alkali metals tend to be really reactive in water. So the alkali metal group involves things like lithium, sodium, and potassium. When you put them in water, they start to ignite. And this is because they all have the same number of valence electrons. Alkali metals have just one valence electron, so that means they're desperately looking to just give up that electron, because if they do so, they become stable. They satisfy the octet rule. All right. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Wind Chemistry, where we'll discuss periodic trends.